Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. Today, I'd like to talk about hyperbolic geometry. And since my usual recording setup is broken, I thought I'd take this opportunity to try out a new format. Let me know what you think in the comments. Recently, I stumbled across an interesting game called Hyper Rogue. As the name suggests, it's a roguelike, which means turn-based exploration of a procedurally generated world, and it's set in hyperbolic geometry. Let's dive in, and you'll see what I mean. The gameplay itself is fairly straightforward. The goal is to collect these treasures scattered around the world, and to deal with the enemies who show up to stop us. What's interesting, though, is the space that we're exploring. Perhaps the first sign that something strange is going on is the tiles we're standing on. If you've played a lot of games before, you've probably played something on a hexagonal grid. Looks something like this. But if you look at the tiles here, well, we've got a hexagon, albeit with pointy sides, a hexagon, a hexagon, and... Hang on, this one's got seven sides. That's a heptagon. And if we look at this intersection point here, that's two hexagons, each with angle 120, and a heptagon with angle 128. And that adds up to more than 360. What's going on here? You've actually seen something like this before on the surface of a soccer ball. At each vertex, we have three polygons coming together, two hexagons and a pentagon, which have angles 120, 120, and 108. And that adds up to less than 360. Or, rather, the flat polygons do. But a soccer ball is, well, a ball. It has curvature. And taking those curves into account makes the angles a little bit bigger. So the angles at each vertex really do add to 360. It's only our attempt to flatten it out, our projection into Euclidean space, that makes things fail to add up. And the same thing is happening here in hyperbolic space. The angles at each vertex really do add up to 360. We just need to be on a surface that's curved in the right way. And here we can see what that surface would look like with the game playing on it. That's a little bit busy, so here's a crochet a version of the same shape, and I'll link to a pattern in the description. You can see that at every point on that surface, we have what's known as a saddle point. The surface curves one way in one direction, and the opposite way in the perpendicular direction. We say that this surface has a negative curvature. So, hyperbolic geometry is the study of this negatively curved space. Okay, so we've seen a bit of what hyperbolic geometry looks like, but what actually is it? Well, hyperbolic geometry is a form of non-Euclidean geometry, so to answer that, we first need to look to Euclid. Around 300 BC, Euclid wrote The Elements, where he compiled the foundations of geometry. The book begins with definitions of points and lines and such, followed by five postulates, that is, the geometric assumptions Euclid needed to make. The first four of these are pretty tame. You can draw a line between two points, you can extend a line segment into a line, you can draw a circle around a point with a given radius, and all right angles are congruent. All simple, all fairly self-evident. The fifth, though, is a bit trickier. It says that if two lines, L and M, both intersect a third line, N, and the angles on one side of N add to less than two right angles, then L and M must intersect on that same side of N. That's much more complicated, and it feels a lot less obvious than the other postulates. So, for 2,000 years, mathematicians suspected that it could be just a consequence of the others. But no one could prove it. And it turns out that's because it doesn't actually have to be true. In the 19th century, Gauss, Lobachevsky, and Boulier independently discovered that there exist geometries where Euclid's fifth postulate is false. In particular, they'd found hyperbolic geometry. 
There are several equivalent ways to formulate hyperbolic geometry, but the one Hyperrogue uses by default is known as the Poincaré disk model. This disk is the entire space. So the entire game world, which expands out infinitely in every direction, is compressed into this little black region along the border. And a line in this space looks like the arc of a circle which is perpendicular to the outer disk. So this wall is a line, and as I step away, it's still a line, but now it looks more like a circle. Why do we call it a line if it isn't straight? Well, the shortest distance between two points is along a line, and in hyperbolic space, we measure distance differently. Paths near the center of the disk are shorter than paths further away, closer to the edge. That's why moving from here to here takes three steps, while moving from here to here takes only one, even though these are closer together on the screen than these. So taking a path that bends inward toward the center is usually shorter than following a straight line, and it turns out the shortest possible path is along a circle. This has a strange consequence when we consider parallel lines. In Euclidean geometry, if you have a point and a line, there's exactly one parallel line through that point. In fact, that's an equivalent statement to Euclid's fifth postulate. But in hyperbolic space, we can have more than one. Here, the red and green lines are both parallel to the blue, since they don't intersect it. But they intersect each other. They both pass through point P. And they aren't the only ones. There are infinitely many parallels to a line through any given point. That makes a bit more sense when we return to our crochet model. Each of these lines follows the curvature of the surface. And because the yarn is all bunched up, those lines diverge. So there are lots of lines that never meet the line at the bottom, but still intersect each other. That is, there are many parallels to a line through a point. Hang on, if this disk is the whole world, how is the camera following us as we move? It's easy enough in Euclidean geometry, just slide the plane over to meet the player. But if we tried that here, we'd have to move the disk, too. Instead, what we need to use is a tool known as a Mobius transformation. Mobius transformations are functions on the complex plane, of the form z to az plus b over cz plus d. They're useful in a lot of contexts because of one key feature. Lines and circles get mapped onto lines and circles. There's a really great old video illustrating how Mobius transformations work, which I've linked below. The basic idea is that we can map the plane onto a sphere, and Mobius transformations capture the movements and rotations of that sphere. For purposes of hyperbolic geometry, we're looking at a restricted group of Mobius transformations, the ones that leave the disk in place. These have the form e to the i phi times z plus b over b conjugate z plus 1. These also conveniently preserve hyperbolic distances, which is a part of the reason we chose this distance metric. So, with an appropriate choice of Mobius transformation, we can rotate the world to keep the player at the center. Hyperbolic geometry makes for some interesting games and cool artwork, and it has uses in fields like relativity, data visualization, and the biology of smell. But for me, the most interesting feature is that it comes from confronting our basic assumptions. When we challenge the postulates laid out by Euclid thousands of years ago, the weird and beautiful structure of hyperbolic geometry falls out. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.